So we're going to talk about uh, ways to combat high altitude uh, effects. So most of the time when we're flying um, missions <clears throat> as an air crew, we're, we're not higher than 1,000 feet. Uh, occasionally we get down to 500, uh, as Colonel Denisick mentioned. However, there are times where, um, where we are going to have to do high flights uh, for transit from place to place, uh, getting to a search area and coming back from a search area. So we may be at altitude and that has some effects on us. Okay, so we're gonna talk about um, hypoxia and dehydration. Those are the main things you're gonna deal with. And we're gonna talk about how to keep our ears comfortable and safe because if you're in pain, it's very, very hard to stay focused and do a good job as a scanner. So we're gonna look at those areas. So dehydration, let's start with that. Dehydration means that the body is basically needs fluids. And when you need fluids, there are a number of things that make you want to have fluids. Just normally our bodies are through our skin, our lungs, our kidneys, all of those parts of our bodies uh, and our, our breathing, we lose uh, some of the moisture that's in our body. And if it goes on long enough, you get in a state called dehydration. Some of the symptoms are dryness of throat, uh, your tissues are irritated, your eyes are irritated, your nose and throat, and it's, it's really uncomfortable. To keep from getting dehydrated, it's a good idea to kind of load your body with fluids before you go on a mission. The recommendation is that you drink basically about 20 ounces. So that would be approximately one and three quarters of cans of soda or juice or whatever. Uh, it's not recommended that you use soda, tea, coffee, things of that nature because they contain caffeine. And caffeine does a couple things. One, it's a stimulant. Two, it happens to uh, mix, blend with other chemicals that are part of your body, and uh, it's a diuretic. So that raises a real problem that we have, particularly some of the, the older guys like Colonel Denisick. <laughs> I'm going to pick on you tonight, uh, and me. Uh, we always make sure that we make a potty pause before we fly a mission. It's not a good idea to avoid that circumstance by letting yourself get dehydrated, it's a better idea to stay well hydrated all the time. So stay away from the coffee and the tea and the cola and the cocoa because of the issues that it brings up. Staying hydrated is pretty simple. All we have to do is, is increase the, uh, the amount of fluid in our body. And while we're flying, it's a good idea to, to carry a bottle of water with you and take a couple sips every 15 or 20 minutes, something like that, so you stay uh, well hydrated. If you get hot and uncomfortable, that contributes to fatigue. And that fatigue can come in the form of just being kind of listless and, and tired all the time. Uh, there's another kind of fatigue that nobody's talked about, but I call it fanny fatigue. When you're sitting in the airplane and the seats are not as cushy and comfortable as your couch, your rear end tends to get a little bit worn out. So as was mentioned earlier, it's a good idea to speak up and say, hey, I need a break, take a little bit of water and uh, stretch, move around a little bit and get the blood flowing and um, help yourself out that way. So that way you can focus on your job as a scanner. If you're hot, and a lot of times, particularly in our area, uh, we're flying in airplanes where the cabin is hot because uh, we're in a hot environment. The windows are closed and there isn't a lot of good airflow. So it's important to tell the pilot uh, or the observer or both that they need to increase the airflow, particularly if you're in the back seat, because uh, the airflow back there isn't all that great. So let them know about that. And you can lower the temperature of the cockpit by opening the vents and in some airplanes, you can even do the windows, but I think, I'm, I know that there's a speed limit on our windows on the 182s and the 172s, and I'm thinking it's something around 
80, 80 knots or something like that. Uh, I just remember that it's uh, almost impossible to open the windows with CFT 80 knots, so that's probably about the maximum. Yeah, um, I know you can fly with them, but nobody nobody does, and I don't think that's in line with the uh, uh, regulations for aircraft operation. But uh, definitely when you're on the ground uh, waiting to launch or taxing and so forth, keep the windows open, the doors as, as appropriate. If you're really getting hot, ask the pilot if they can climb up to a higher altitude because the higher up in the air, in the uh, atmosphere you go, the temperature drops and it gets cooler. So typically, if you were 80 degrees down here in Kihei or Kahului, uh, and you were to fly to the, over the top of Haleakala, you're now at 10,000 feet. So you're dropped down to about 50 degrees of ambient temperature. So it does get colder as you go up. So that's a way to mitigate the uh, heat in the, in the cabin if that's necessary. That kind of excess heat also contributes to an additional to fatigue, but also can it uh, contribute to uh, motion sickness. So keep those in mind and utilize those tricks to uh, keep yourself comfortable and effective. Okay, uh, ear blocks. Can you guys give me uh, a verbal response? As have, have you all had the experience of flying on commercial airplanes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. Okay. Well, you might have noticed, maybe you didn't, but you might have noticed that when you're taking off and when you're landing, you're yawning or wiggling your jaw or what's commonly known as popping your ears. Uh, the same thing happens in diving, which is what I do for a living. There are some problems that come up with that. What we're doing is we have basically 15 pounds of pressure in our heads and against our ears when we're at sea level. When you go up to altitude, that pressure reduces. So the air that's trapped in your head and your ears, will ex uh, it expands and normally it just goes away and it goes away just by respiration. But when you're coming back down, your ears now have the amount of pressure from whatever altitude you were at. And as you're going down, and this is true for diving as well as, as flying, as you're going down, that pressure needs to get equalized because it needs to go somewhere. So you blow air into your ear to push the ear drum back out. Basically, if you have a cold or congestion or allergies, you don't want to go flying either as a crew member or a pilot because uh, it can create ear blocks and that can hurt a lot. In fact, if it, hurt, if it happens enough, it could result in uh, rupturing your eardrum and that's really, really painful. The other thing that can happen is you have what's called a sinus block. Basically, it just makes equalizing difficult. So when you're descending, it's a good idea that as soon as you feel the slightest difference in your ears, whatever you call that to be, it's time to equalize. Now, there are a bunch of ways to do that. One of them is called a Valsalva, and that's the one you probably know about, which is pinching your nose and blowing gently and uh, uh, with pinched nostrils, and that adds air through what's called eustachian tubes, and it sends air up into your middle ear and pushes back against the air from the outside that's pushing in on your eardrum and stretching it. Your sinuses do the same thing, but if you've got a cold or, or swelling because of a cold, sinusitis, allergies, then the tissues that make up that structure get blocked. And you can't get, you can't force the air in and the air sometimes can't get out. And that's what's known as a sinus block. Depending on which, where you're going, it's whether you're going up or down, it's a sinus block or a reverse block. So without getting really technical about it, if you have a cold or congestion, don't go flying. That's the simplest way to do it. So let's move on to hypoxia. Hypoxia means that the amount of oxygen that you're getting from the air that you breathe 
isn't getting enough force to push it into your, your bloodstream. At sea level, we have about 15 pounds of pressure pushing oxygen molecules into our lungs and our blood and so forth. When you're up at high altitude, there's not enough push to push those oxygen model molecules into your lungs, your capillaries, and, and your bloodstream. And so the air gets quote unquote thinner. It's the same amount of oxygen, it's just that the particles are farther away. And so every time you inhale, you get fewer of those particles or molecules. And so you don't have the same oxygen level. The way we know that is we use a thing called a pulse oximeter and basically it measures the amount of oxygen in your blood. A lot of pilots carry those and then some of the airplanes and if you've ever been in a hospital, they put a little thing on your finger and it tells what your uh, concentration of oxygen is. So we don't have a way to do that normally. So basically what we want to do is make sure that when you're at altitude, you're going to feel a little bit maybe lethargic. You might get headaches and so forth. So the easiest way to do that is to fly relatively low level. And if you're flying high altitude, basically what we do is we use supplemental oxygen. So pilots, you'll see them even in um, uh, private airplanes, if they fly at high altitude levels, they'll have built-in or portable oxygen systems and the pilots and the crew use those. Um, anytime you are hypoxic, particularly if you're working at uh, twilight or night, it has an impact on your night vision. And that can happen as low as 5,000 feet above sea level. And there's no way that you can know it. So you just need to be aware of the symptoms and they vary from person to person. And moreover, they vary from day to day on the same person. So it's really important to be aware that this can be a problem. Okay, we touched on these a little bit ahead. So yawn, swallow, tense the muscles in your throat. There's another one called the Frenzel maneuver where you just like swallow. Yawning, if you ever, if you have the uh, uh, opportunity to be in a quiet room, like when you get up in the morning or you're going to bed at, you know, at night and it's quiet in your environment and you yawn and you'll hear air moving in your ears or uh, a little squeaky or poppy noise. And that's what's happening. You're unblocking your uh, eustachian tubes. Dealing with hypoxia, uh, alcohol and depressants are not a good idea. And so if you have a cold, you don't want to use um, antihistamines and um, decongestants because two things can happen. One, they tend to slow you down, make you a little um, lethargic. And the other thing is they can wear off during the flight. So you're fine, but it wears off. And then you have all this pressure or lack of it in your ears and you can't fix it by using the normal things that pop in your ears. So uh, if you have to use uh, uh, antihistamines and, and uh, uh, decongestants, just don't go flying. And we already talked about supplemental oxygen, beat that to death. We're not going to use that in CAP, uh, at least here in Hawaii. And I don't know of anybody who does use supplemental. Do you, Colonel? Yeah, we use it at uh, Green Flag. Uh, some of our uh, sorties, we fly at 16,000 feet uh, between the surrogate uh, predator uh, program. So we have portable bottles on CAP aircraft? Uh, we have 206 uh, with a built-in oxygen system. Here in, in Hawaii wing? No, that's in uh, Green Flag out in uh, uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, I was thinking Kona Shield. Okay, 